This is Duke University. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll ask, I would ask you how you're doing, but your mouths are full and your stomachs are full, so I, I'm going to assume you're doing okay. Um, so as Jason said, my name is John Gartrell, and I'm the director of the Franklin Research Center uh, for African and African American History and Culture over at the Rubenstein Library, the newly renovated Rubenstein Library, which I would encourage any one of you who has not been over to West Campus uh, fairly recently, please come by and see the new building. Um, it's it's we're, you know, hoping that it will be one of the newest gems on Duke's campus uh, for a long, long time. Um, Jason, thank you again for the introduction. Uh, Jason and I have two things in common. Uh, the first thing is we both have identical twins. Mine are almost seven months. So I get a lot of advice from Jason about what it is I'm doing wrong. Uh, the second thing we have in common is that I have no doubt that people will come to our respective offices looking for us. So you all are the John Hope Franklin Center. I'm the John Hope Franklin Research Center. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about what the difference is, and that will lead us right into what our presentation today is. So we are uh, the collecting arm of the Rubenstein Library, and we collect rare books, uh, manuscripts, ephemera, um, any kind of historical material dealing with African and African American history and culture. Uh, we were founded in 1995, and I can proudly say, hoping that I will not get thrown out after I say this, that we were the first thing to be named after John Hope Franklin at Duke uh, when he decided to donate his papers to the what was then the Rare Book and Manuscript Library. Um, when Dr. Franklin donated his materials in 1995, uh, he left us with a tremendous documentary legacy. Uh, his life uh, is comprised of well over 300 boxes. Um, so I often tell students when we have uh, instruction sessions, and I'll share and I'll say the same to you all, that when we put your life in a box, how many boxes will um, it take up? Um, so I'm going to walk you through something and, and kind of reflect and there's a lot of pressure in this being the last uh, event here for the, the year, so you know, bear with me. Um, if you don't like it, just don't walk out. You just kind of <laughs> just wave your hand and take a nap. It's okay. Um, so <clears throat> two weeks ago, we had a symposium here at Duke um, honoring the life and legacy of Dr. Franklin. Um, it was called Global Slaveries and Possible Freedoms, um, the Intellectual Legacies of John Hope Franklin. And that symposium um, was amazing to be in attendance. Uh, hopefully, for those that, that missed it, you'll check out some of the videos that are now online of the many lectures uh, that took place. Um, but I think one thing that symposium, uh, that, that at least I took away from the symposium, was that Dr. Franklin's legacy here in the States is unquestioned. He has, he mentored so many scholars, um, generations of scholars, those that came after him, that came after them, that came after them. His scholarship influenced so many contemporary scholars and, and the symposium did a tremendous job of each presenter really sort of shared a piece of what Dr. Franklin taught them. Um, and so it's clear that um, his American influence is, um, you know, tremendous. Uh, but when I was given the task to curate a very modest exhibition on Dr. Franklin's life uh, about two years, no, actually when I first got here in 2012, we were talking about John Hope Franklin in 100 and 2015. Um, and when they told me it was 300 boxes, I knew I had to get working on it. So it took me about a year to actually go through his stuff. Um, and I didn't even get, I would say I maybe half of it. Uh, but what became clear to me as I um, worked through it and my graduate intern, um, Carlin Forner, worked through the materials is that Dr. Franklin's intellectual legacy is an international one in as much as it is a domestic one. Um, so the more and more that I, I, I comb through that material, I, there are two things that became extremely evident to me. One is the man clearly never slept, okay? Uh, he was, his uh, assistant, uh, Margaret Fitzsimmons, 
would type out itineraries and give them to Mrs. Franklin Aurelia. Um, and there's copies of these itineraries in his papers. And she would do it for at least the next nine to 12 months. So he had a schedule out of when, when I tell you there was something going, it seemed like every other week he was in a different place. And many of those places were international. So I don't know, and I don't know how the man slept. And if he did slept, then he must have got really good at sleeping on planes and trains uh, because he was, like I said, all over the place. Um, and so when I was putting together the exhibit, I, I thought it would be really nice to sort of play this game in the gallery of, you know, well, where in the world is John Hope Franklin? Um, it didn't really come to fruition the way I wanted it to, but I, I decided that, well, I came across a tool that helped me really map out where Dr. Franklin was. And I wanted to use that tool to share with you all today um, where Dr. Franklin was, the, the, the global scholar that was John Hope Franklin. Uh, this is my first time doing anything like this, so bear with me. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I hope you'll join me now to see the world through the eyes of, of Dr. Franklin. And hopefully you will discover that um, just as the subtitle of our recent symposium suggests that uh, the intellectual legacies of Dr. Franklin can be found in nearly every corner of the globe. Uh, so, of course, Dr. Franklin was born in uh, a very small town, an all-black town called Rennesville, Oklahoma, in 1915. And he probably never imagined uh, that, you know, being a, a black boy in the Jim Crow South and in Jim Crow America, that he would ever see uh, the, the, the world, really. Um, but his many affiliations, particularly with um, the Salzburg um, Seminar for American Studies, the Board of Foreign Scholarship, which we now call the Fulbright, um, and the, the U.S. Um, Department of State, uh, he was able to sort of spread his legacy around the world. Um, so again, one of the, the, the great things, as I said, was is Dr. Franklin's documentary legacy. And so just to give you a sense of where he went from Oklahoma his next step was in Nashville, uh, Tennessee, uh, where he went to Fisk University um, and got his bachelor's degree there in history. Um, this is actually a grade book of Dr. Franklin's from when he was at Fisk, um, where he recorded all of his, his grades from the classes that he took. Um, uh, when he graduates from Fisk, he goes to Harvard for graduate school and while at Harvard, um, working on his PhD, he accepts a position at St. Augustine's College um, in nearby Raleigh, North Carolina. This is a picture of him at one of the commencement uh, addresses. And then, of course, we know from St. Augustine's, uh, he moves to the North Carolina uh, College for Negroes um, here in Durham, which we now know as North Carolina Central. Uh, this is a yearbook from uh, 1946, um, and you will find Dr. Franklin's picture in there as a professor of history, but you will also find his wife's picture in this year book because she was the librarian at the law school at Central. <clears throat> From there, he goes to Washington, D.C., and teaches, uh, becomes a professor of history at Howard University. And from there, uh, while at Howard, he joins the Salzburg Seminar for American Studies. Um, so in 1951, John O. Franklin takes his first international trip. Um, and the Salzburg Seminar was originally founded in 1947 um, as an international forum for those uh, seeking a better Europe and world. Um, yes. Uh, so here is a... Uh, a travel permit for Dr. Franklin to travel to Vienna and Salzburg. And these are the, his lecture notes on what he would lecture on. Um, so you'll see it's really a, a, a lecture on American history and, and uh, the different classes. So the, the aftermath of the Civil War, uh, the passing of the frontier, 
um, kind of immigration uh, during the civil, since the Civil War, uh, the birth of the city, et cetera. Um, so this is really the beginning of Dr. Franklin and his um, international travel. <laughs> Uh, by 1953, um, Franklin begins working with the Board of Foreign Scholarships, um, as I said, commonly known as the Fulbright uh, Program. And in 1955, <coughs> excuse me, 55, uh, Franklin travels to London to record a lecture entitled Desegregation, the New Dilemma of the American South, which uh, was broadcast on BBC in September of 1955. Of course, Franklin would be an expert at that topic because the year before he had served on the legal team of the NAACP as a scholar working on the Brown versus Board of Education. Um, <clears throat> and this is really, uh, I would say, one of the, the first streams of John Hope Franklin's international influence in interpreting what's going on in America to an international audience. In 1957, he finds himself in Calcutta, India. <clears throat> um, this is a letter uh, from John Hope to his wife, uh, Aurelia. And he, he writes, uh, Dearest Aurelia, the most apt description of life in the last two days is hectic. The centenary celebrations uh, have been, of course, quite con time consuming. Convocations, symposiums, receptions, and the like. I'm just floored by all the types of people, people of, by the people of all types and kinds, largely poor, dreadfully poor, beggars, refugees from East Pakistan, sleeping on the streets day and night, etc. I hope my pictures are good. Uh, you'll get an eyeful. But yesterday, when I was within five feet of the Dalai Lama visiting from Tibet, I did not have a camera. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, in that transitionary period um, between 51 and 57, uh, John O. Franklin moves to Brooklyn where he becomes a professor at Brooklyn College, uh, of course the first African American to become a professor um, at a traditionally a full-time tenured professor at a, um, <clears throat> a traditionally white institution. And there's his trip to Calcutta. Um, and he was actually there uh, during the centenary celebrations of the Indian War of Independence. And he saw the Dalai Lama, but didn't have his camera on him. Uh, had it been 2007, he might have had a camera phone and would have been much easier to take a picture. Uh, 1959, um, he is a visiting professor at the University of Hawaii. Um, this is not an international trip, of course. Uh, However, <clears throat> it's at the University of Hawaii where Dr. Franklin, um, who spent, I believe, a year there, um, is introduced to orchids. Uh, and of course, that's one of the things that he's most known for is being an avid orchid grower. Uh, so in his autobiography, he talks about how um, it, that's really where he falls in, in love with, with orchids. Um, and so you see some of the pictures here. These are uh, Dr. Franklin in his greenhouse uh, in Chicago, which is later on in his life. Uh, the one on the end is actually the John O. Franklin orchid. Um, <clears throat> but um, Dr. Franklin goes on to collect orchids around the world. Um, and he brings them back to America with them, and they become a part of this collection. And I believe when I was talking with um, John Franklin, uh, he mentioned that he had well over 50 or 60 species in his greenhouse um, when he was alive. And it was John's responsibility, along with many of his graduate students, to, to make sure that the, the orchid stayed alive through the winters of Brooklyn, Chicago, <laughs> and, and Durham. <laughs> Nineteen sixty, um, Dr. Franklin travels to Lagos, uh, Nigeria. Um, it's here that he serves as the representative of the U.S. State Department 
uh, for the celebrations of Nigeria's independence. <clears throat> Uh, this is an, an, an invitation to a state dinner um, or the state opening of parliament in Lagos. Uh, here's a, a, um, <clears throat> a work permit uh, for Dr. Franklin to travel. Um, he's noted as uh, serving as a uh, United States specialist. Um, and it notes that his tra transportation from his home to Lagos and return to Washington, D.C. Um, <clears throat> so again, his affiliation with uh, the Department of State um, really opens doors for him to, 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 to go into many, and this is one of many independent celebrations that Dr. Franklin would attend. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, again, a testament to his scholarship that when he writes From Slavery to Freedom in 1947, that he starts the experience of African Americans in Africa um, and detailing the legacy of empires and civilization in Africa before colonialism. And here he comes full circle, beginning in 1960, attending so many um, celebrations of independence on the continent. Um, and it, it also allows him to weave in these narratives as he writes more and more editions of the seminal work of From Slavery to Freedom. The same year he visits Australia <clears throat> and he um, holds a number of lectures uh, throughout the country um, one of which is the problems of segregation and desegregation in the United States. Um, this one's at the University of Melbourne. He also gave lectures at the University of Sydney as well. And I'll blow that up for you. There's another public lecture at Canberra University, um, Abraham Lincoln and the Politics of the War. Nineteen sixty-three, um, Franklin uh, becomes the Pitt Professor of History at Cambridge University of Cambridge um, at St. John's College. Um, <clears throat> this was a a significant moment for Franklin in his life. Uh, he's the first African American to become a Pitt Professor of History at Cambridge, and it's his. Again, his international appointments, um, in many ways, these are the, the first time that students outside of America have seen an African American as a professor lecturing in their class. Um, and I was, as I was going back through uh, the materials um, on his time in Cambridge, of which there, there's quite a bit, um, Franklin mentions that you know at Cambridge, you can just sort of pop in on a lecture. And there were times when the room was filled to capacity, over 150 people just here, just there to hear his lectures. And he was extremely flattered by that. Um, it was also during this period, uh, and I'll, I'll save this to the end, that he was extremely busy, um, again, explaining what was going on. Think 1963, March on Washington, OK? Um, and so what is the civil rights movement, and what are the implications of it? Um, and his presence in England, he had a number of opportunities to go on television to talk about what was going on back in America. And in each of these instances, um, he never just, just starts the narrative with what's going on in that time. He always weaves in the entire history of the presence of people of color uh, in this country. I mean, he brings it to fore on the forefront of today. And it, it, it sort of ties into what um, Dr. Angela Davis was speaking of at the symposium of having historically minded people um, all the way um, and, and the kind of context that he lent to helping people understand what was going on didn't just start in 1960 or with Rosa Parks. It started with 1619 when the first Africans arrived in the Virginia colony and goes all the way up to modern day. Um, <clears throat> During his visit um, to Cambridge, uh, 
you see him here with his son, um, John, uh, and his, his wife, Aurelia. And all these photos were actually published in a, a full page spread in Ebony Magazine, um, which of course is a, a traditionally black publication um, out of Chicago. Um, so you could, again, see the sense of pride in the African-American community for what Dr. Franklin was doing abroad. Um, and there's also a letter uh, in his papers that's dated August the 22nd um, from David Bruce, who's the American ambassador uh, to England. And he says that, uh, dear Dr. Franklin, many of us have noticed uh, the great success of your year in Britain. I want to express my appreciation for the outstanding service you have performed. I'm aware of the large number of effective speeches you have made before important audiences in Britain and in other countries, the television appearances you have made in order to explain American policies and problems, and the writing you have done to increase understanding of American events. Uh, to have done all these in addition to serving as Pitt professor is a notable accomplishment. All Americans are indebted to you for your contributions. Um, I wish you well in your new position, and I'll get to that in a minute, um, and hope that you will have new opportunities in the future to represent America abroad. Um, sincerely, David Bruce. Uh, that same year, Franklin finds himself in Zanzibar. Uh, <clears throat> and it, it's, it's there that he attends the uh, independence celebrations of Zanzibar, again as a guest of the US uh, Secretary of State. Um, and here he is at a reception um, one of the many receptions uh, in the country of the celebrations there. And here's an invitation from the uh, Sultan of Zanzibar uh, to attend uh, one of the ceremonies. <laughs> 1963 again, he, here he is in Germany uh, as a visiting lecturer. And it's in 1964 uh, that John O. Franklin trans transitions from Brooklyn College to the University of Chicago. Uh, he goes on to chair the Department of History there and is the John Matthews Manley Distinguished um, Professor there. 1964, he returns back to India as a member of the Board of Foreign Scholarship. Uh, that same service takes him to Greece, Turkey, and Iran in 1965. 1966, Cyprus, Iraq, Syria, Israel. Um, <clears throat> in the, this interim period, 64, 65, 66, uh, John Hope takes on a number of positions in the uh, Board of Foreign Scholarship, culminating in 1966 when he becomes chairman of the board. Um, and so one of the things that, uh, critical things that he was doing during this time period was um, visiting um, offices, uh, checking in with fellows, trying to get a sense of what some of the issues were on the ground, which ranged from uh, currency discrepancies to living conditions to um, student relationships. Um, so <clears throat> his travels throughout uh, the Middle East and the Mediterranean during this time period were um, extremely important to uh, to continuing the work of the board, um, particularly as the chairman uh, during this time period. Let me jump back real quick. Ah, 1966, he's back in India again. Um, here he is lecturing at the India International Center. Um, <clears throat> and his topic, Civil Rights Movement in the United States. Nineteen sixty-seven, Trinidad, uh, the independent celebrations for Trinidad. He's the guest of Eric Williams, who is a, another uh, historian and prime minister of the country there. Um, <clears throat> he was quoted uh, in the papers um, in 67 during his lecture tour uh, of talking about how at this moment, this is sort of the transitionary period before, between what we would traditionally call the civil rights era and the black power movement of how now here's a moment where the United States is finally listening to black folks um, 
you know, again, you begin to see um, violent uprisings in urban centers. And here's Franklin again explaining and giving historical context to why some of the events uh, are taking place. Uh, and you see a program, he has three public lectures at the public library. Um, again, standing room only. Uh, this is a picture um, from one of the lectures that was printed in the Trinidad, uh, Trinidadian, in the Guardian newspaper, excuse me. Um, See, where is he now? I don't work. Are you dizzy yet? Because I am. I, okay, all right. Um, 68, Turkey, Austria, Yugoslavia. Uh, again, working through under the auspices of the Board of Foreign Scholarships. Okay, 1973, and I should add a note. Um, in between there, in 1970, uh, he takes a visit to the Soviet Union. Uh, he's a, actually a guest of the United States uh, Information Agency. Uh, he, visit Mos he visits Moscow and Tehran um, and is an observer of an American exhibition in the Soviet Union um, that dealt with uh, education in America. Um, but he was also asked by many of the persons that he visited uh, to talk about and, and lecture on student protests. And much of the student unrest that's taking place at this time, the Vietnam War, um, <clears throat> and many of the issues that are going on on college campuses. Um, so in 1973, here he is in, in Cebu City in the Philippines. Uh, he's a Lincoln lecturer um, <clears throat> with the Board of Foreign Scholarships. Nineteen seventy three, uh, he visits Brazil and Chile again uh, as a Lincoln lecture for the, the board. It's actually uh, Aurelia Franklin at dinner. Uh, and here's him lecturing to a, a group here. Uh, Nineteen seventy seven, he gives a series of lectures. Um, on the African continent, um, in Ghana, Nigeria, uh, as well as Liberia. Um, this was under the auspices of the Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs of the Department of State. Um, he was there, he was in Africa for about a month and a half. Um, and in addition to <coughs> his lecturing, um, he also was there for his own personal research. Uh, you see, at the time, he was almost done uh, with his research on George Washington Williams, uh, who was, at least for him, uh, he was largely considered the first black historian. Um, he learned about Williams while researching From Slavery to Freedom in 1947, and it took him about 40 years to do all the research on George Washington Williams and finally publish a biography on Williams in 1985. Uh, Williams actually spent, um, he was uh, uh, in the, the US military, in the, the Union Army during the Civil War, uh, came up in Massachusetts, lived in Ohio, was a preacher and a minister, but also a politician. But he also went to the Congo, <clears throat> excuse me, um, during the, the reign of King Leopold. Um, so Franklin used his opportunity while he was lecturing in, uh, in West Africa to visit Kinshasa, to visit the Congo, um, and Senegal. Nineteen seventy nine. Franklin visits China. Um, this is one of the earliest, um, or one of the first um, visits by American scholars to China um, and sort of the, the, the post-communist uh, rule. Um, <clears throat> so he gives a number of lectures um, 
and was invited by the World History Research Institute of the uh, Chinese Academy for Social Sciences to talk about issues of history and historiography. Um, and his, uh, one of his lectures is, is actually entitled Historians and the Black Movement. Um, and this is one that he delivers at the, at the, Hist the World History Research Institute. Uh, he says that this whole phenomenon, meaning uh, African-American participation in, uh, in history, um, this whole phenomenon was as much a part of the Negro movement as the demand for better jobs, housing, education, and a more equitable administration, uh, administration of justice. It was as though Negro Americans were saying that the past injustices done them and recounting the history of the country are part and parcel of the injustices they had suffered in other areas. If the house was to be set in order, one could not begin with the present, but he had to begin with the past. Um, and he's commenting on sort of the, the explosion of black historiography. Um, and the the nation's, as well as the world's interest in what the history of African Americans really was, which is ironic because he wrote a history of African Americans 50, 40 years ago, before that, but 30 years before that. Um, but nevertheless, he's still championing this message of the importance of history, the importance of African American contributions to American history um, around the globe. 1980. Um, he attends uh, the UNESCO, con uh, UNESCO conference in Belgrade, Serbia. Here's his work permit here, his travel permit. And in 1981, um, he visits Dakar, Senegal, um, where again, he gives a number of lectures throughout that country. Here's a picture of him with uh, Leopold Senghor, who at that point was the former president, um, the first president of independent Senegal, um, and a photo of him uh, delivering lectures here. That's a photo of his son in the background there. Nineteen eighty-six. Uh, again, he finds himself in Zimbabwe. In nineteen ninety, um, this is shortly after the fall of the Berlin Wall. He finds himself in Berlin, um, and um, he gives a talk at the Institute of North American Studies at the Free University of Berlin. And his topic then is what Europeans should understand about African-American history. Um, and again, that the story of American cannot be told without understanding the experience and lives of African-Americans. Okay, I'm, I'm catching up to him. I, I kind of know where he is. Uh, 1998, uh, he finds himself back in Senegal uh, where he actually films a documentary uh, with Bishop Desmond Tutu uh, for PBS. Uh, it's entitled A Journey Toward Freedom. Um, play a clip of it here. I don't know if we have a second. It is a seemingly magical island suspended in time. A place of beautiful sunrises, laughing children, and dazzling colors that mask a terrible past. Gore Island, Senegal, the place where two extraordinary men would come together from opposite sides of the world. Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Dr. John Hope Franklin were about to begin an historic journey of hope, determined to combine their insights for a new world vision of true racial reconciliation. They would pass that vision on to a lively group of questioning students, and they would become new friends, sharing the unique experience each had gone through in working to heal his country's racial wounds. Okay. Um, and again, as the, the clip said, that 
uh, Franklin and Tutu ended up having a conversation with um, white South Africans and black South Africans about race. Um, and it, it's a very contentious conversation about the differences of their various experiences. Uh, but the whole point of the conversation was to begin um, a process of reconciliation, um, which mirrors Franklin's work here in America and his efforts to, particularly in his hometown of Tulsa, Oklahoma, which we just had a, a talk with the group from the John O. Franklin Center for Reconciliation. Um, so for Franklin, having these kind of public open discourses, both domestically and internationally, was, was the path to finding common ground. In 2001, um, Franklin is a uh, visit South Africa as a representative of uh, the U.S. Department of State. That particular year, he al they also debuted uh, the documentary film Journey, Journey Toward Freedom um, in South Africa. So they had an opening of the documentary film there. And that is also the year where this very building was opened. So you see how I, see how I wove that in? That was good. That was good. <laughs> So this whole conversation we've been having about Franklin and his international legacy comes full circle by having a, a, an institution, an actual physical space, um, which is dedicated to the study of international relations. Uh, and of course, by 2000, uh, 2009, Dr. Franklin passes away. Um, and in the course of, of many of those visits after 1981, he's a professor here at Duke, James B. Duke Professor of History. Um, and I'll just end, I think this is, uh, here's the, uh, the, the materials from his lecture in Berlin in 1990. This is one of my favorite pictures, um, cause I, you just never see Dr. Franklin kind of relaxing. Um, he's always very, you know, prestigious and dignified. Uh, but this is actually uh, the journey that he took on the Queen Mary to go to Cambridge in 1963. And I just wanted to kind of end on this. Um, this is a letter from that very same journey um, from Dr. Franklin to the president of Brooklyn College um, in 1963. And he sort of gives them a report about what he did at Cambridge. Um, I'm not going to trouble, you know, trouble you all with the whole thing, but just to give you a sense of what his year looked like. Again, I'm not sure if the man actually slept. Um, so I'm pleased to submit to you a report on my acti activities during my sabbatical leave uh, from September the 1st, 1962 to August the 31st, 1963. Uh, permit me to say that at the outset that I'm grateful to Brooklyn College for granting me leave, which it uh, was made possible to accept the invitation from the University of Cambridge. Although it was a very busy year, it was a most rewarding one. Uh, at the beginning of the university, of the year at the university, um, made me eligible to serve as Pitt professor by conferring on me the, the degree of Master of Arts. St. John's College honored me by awarding me a professorial fellowship that carried with it no duties, uh, but the use of a three-room suite. Um, my duties as a Pitt professor were not burdensome by our standards. Um, I gave two lectures each week on the United States in the 19th century. Uh, during the Lent term, I gave two lecture, one lecture per week on the South, uh, the South and American history. Um, I was a member of the governing board of St. John's College uh, and could, get, could cast my vote on the disposition of our Kentish town property acquired in 1585 and register my opinion on the question of the ladies dining hall, um, or the ladies dining in the hall, excuse me, a matter that has been exhaustively discussed since 1920. <laughs> I was greatly flattered by regular attendance at my lectures of students uh, numbering by from 100 to 150, especially since they were not taking my course. <clears throat> Let's see. The following is a list of the university societies before which I lectured. University History Club, Joint Action Group for Understanding Among the Races, the 
Audley Society of Magdalen College, Pembroke College Historical Society, St. John's Historical Society, the Cecil Society of Trinity Hall, St. Catherine's College Historical Society, the Maitland Society of Downing College, Queen's College Historical Society, Cambridge Society of Jew University of Jewish Society, the Arnold Society of Trinity College, the Cambridge International Center. In some quarters in Britain, there is enormous impression that the Pitt Professor of Cambridge is available for lectures anywhere in Britain or on the continent. While I found it impossible to accept all the invitations that came to me, it was a pleasure to get a rather good view of higher education in Britain by accepting in invitations and lecturing to the following institutions. University College London, University of Manchester, University of Kiel, University of Birmingham, Imperial College of Science and Technology, London, University of London, Department of, it goes on, okay. Uh, during the year, it was my privilege also to read papers and appear before learned societies. In October, before the Cambridge Historical Society, I read a paper entitled Emancipation Proclamation. In April, at the when the British Association of American Studies held their annual meeting in Edinburgh, I read a paper on the urban Negro in American history. At the Anglo-American Historical Conference in London, I read a paper on the military occupation of the South. On several occasions, I ventured across the channel to participate in various seminars and to lecture at several continental universities and other institutions. In December, I was a participant at a special seminar at the American Cultural Center in Paris to commemorate the centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation. In January, I went to Germany, lectured in Munich, Cologne, Regensburg. In June and July, I was back in Germany to lecture in Berlin, Kiel, Hamburg. Um, I also delivered the commencement address at Johns Hopkins University Center at Bologna. A miscellany of other activities included two appearances on BBC, one on the Associated uh, Rediffusion, the commercial television network. Uh, the United States Educational Commission for United Kingdom invited me as a member of the Board of Foreign Scholarships to meet with, uh, we meet with it as an observer, and I was pleased to accept. Uh, in May, when the University of Edinburgh published a British edition of my book, The Emancipation Proclamation, I went to Edinburgh and spoke and was tendered a reception by the university. I also found time to do some writing. <laughs> for the United States Information Service, I wrote a pamphlet, The First Century of Freedom, which was widely distributed in Britain, the continent, Asia, and Africa. For the Progressive Magazine, I wrote a piece on civil rights. For the crisis, I wrote an article entitled The Emancipation Proclamation. <laughs> I do not want to convey the impression that I was busy all the time. I made the effort to use the sabbatical year as a time for refreshing. Thus, I spent two glorious weeks in Morocco during Christmas and a pleasant midwinter vacation in Paris. Um, <clears throat> let's see, Brooklyn College remained constantly in my thoughts during the entire visit. My pleasant memories of this place were reinforced by two brief visits that I made to campus in October and in March by a steady stream of friendly and newsly letters from numerous colleges, and he goes on to talk about uh, the hordes of people who came to visit him while in England. But he ends it with this. I ought to confess, though, that another visitor was the chairman of the Department of History of the University of Chicago. And that next year, he goes to the University of Chicago. Uh, so hopefully you get a sense from that letter of what John Hope Franklin's international legacy. This is just one trip in 1963, and hopefully you got a sense from the map that this man was everywhere, clearly. Um, and I was trying to figure out why he dedicated his life to this amazing international service. And I think, this is just my own personal theory, um, I found an answer when I read a letter from John Hope to Lyndon Johnson in, I want to say it was 1967, um, when he thanked him for uh, being able to go to, to one of the many independent celebrations that he went to. And he said that it was a pleasure to serve his country. Um, and I thought about Franklin in his autobiography relaying his experience of attempting to register as a soldier in the US Army, and how he was turned away because of the color of his skin during World War II. 
Um, so for him, his participation in the Salzburg Seminar and the Board of Foreign Scholarship and the Department of State and all of his travel and extensive le lecturing and, and meetings, um, that was his military service, I feel. Um, and to me, that is sort of the, the sort of the, the tying thread to the theme of our centenary celebration. He truly was a scholar, he was an activist, and he was a citizen. Thank you. Thank you so much for this beautiful global journey with this wonderful global scholar. I'm a witness of his visit to Iraq in the mid-60s, 1960s. Okay. And we heard, we were in the fourth year to be graduated that year, we heard that a distinguished American professor is visiting the University of Baghdad. Mm. At that time, also another poet, American poet, MacLeod, came with him. But MacLeod remained for one year, and he taught me American poetry. Mm. But we remember this great professor, elegant, tall man coming from the United States. And when I came to Duke in 2005 within the program, Scholar at Risk program, thanks to Gil Merch, at that time the Vice Provost for International Affairs, who brought me here to the university, I met the same professor and he <laughs> discovered me and he started inviting me to Duke Washington in for lunch three or four times. This is his lovely place, he liked mm. it very much. I'm indebted to him. Mm. For me, he is not dead, he is alive in my, in my memory. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. See, international legacy. Thank you for sharing that. Any other questions or thoughts? Or anybody else meet John Hope Franklin somewhere outside of America? <laughs> no, thank you so much for a beautiful presentation and, and for having now this material uh, you know, available for, for everyone from, from the library. I have just a, a brief question about his trip to, to South America, to Chile in particular. He went in 1973. Mm. I suppose he went before September 11. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, yeah. The, and if if there is something uh, reacting to that date in his papers that have you, you know, I don't know if you have any. I I'll have to go back and check. Um, you know, it, when whenever he traveled, I mean, the, just similar to your experience, sir, um, he made such an impression on pretty much everybody that he ran into and met. Um, and so you would get hordes of letters. You see hordes of letters from people writing him just saying, you know, we appreciate you coming. Um, and so by the time he finally got settled down to read all these, I mean, he would write back and say, you know, I just got my feet back on the ground. I'm so sorry it took me so long to get back to you. But just this grace of correspondence. Um, I, he would often get letters from, and I, I don't want to skate your question, but I'll have to go back and check. Um, but one thing that I also find, found after his international trips is he would get letters from students who were asking him to come to America to study. And, you know, I, I, I was one, I was just reading one the other day when he went to Trinidad. There was a, a, a young boy, he said, I'm 16 years old. I want to study history or economics. Um, I don't know you. You don't know me. But if you would just let me come live with you. Um, I'm a hard worker. I will do whatever it takes. And, you know, it, it, Franklin, of course, he, he got this all the time. You know, I want to come to the University of Chicago. Can you help me get in there? And, you know, he would just kind of graciously just say, you know, I appreciate you getting in touch with me. You might want to try the U.S. Embassy and, you know, that kind of thing. But that's the, that's the international legacy of him. Like, your story, students who were just so captivated by this man, that they wanted to come live with him, sight unseen, um, they just read about him in the paper. Uh, so I'll, I have to double check on whether or not he has any sort of reaction to, to what takes place.
I wonder if you could comment uh, on, based on your work in his archive, about his methods as a scholar. Uh, did he do a, a lot of archival research? What, what kind of primary uh, research did he, primary sources did he use? Just wondering if you'd talk a bit about that. Sure. Um, so Franklin is uh, renowned for his archival research um, to the point where uh, I think one of my professors who used to work at the National Archives told me that whenever he came, they just gave him a room and let him go. Um, he used graduate students, but he actually was one of the first professors, and he, and he had this privilege when he was at Chicago. He would take his PhD students on a tour of Southern archives and teach them and allow them to, to interact with archivists, teach them how to do archival research like on the ground. Um, and many of them who I've had the privilege of meeting, um, one of which actually teaches over at Chapel Hill, Jenna Ray McNeil, um, in the Department of History, um, are extremely grateful. So he was hardcore, I'm going to the archive. Um, that's one of the reasons why it took him 30 years to write the biography of George Washington Williams, because he literally went, Williams was in Massachusetts, Ohio, he dies in London, he spends time in Africa. So as I was saying, he used that trip to Africa to go to the Congo, to, to go and go to the archives there, talk to people, find out about what was going on um, in, in the time period. So um, his method and his methodology um, in terms of writing history is renowned. I mean, he just, he had a microphone reader in his office. Um, so <laughs> yeah, he, he, was, he was tremendous. I think I see, I wanna. No, Professor Franklin, top notch, you know, um, classy guy to say the least. Um, I guess uh, in his, well, I was wondering if you could speak more about, you know, um, scholarship as soldiering and if he had any um, acute thoughts on that subject. Mm -hmm. Secondarily, he was always about, you know, uh, an illustration of the speculative with the operative. I was wondering if you could speak on his talk to what white people should, what Europeans should know about African American history. Did he have any advice on actions to be taken with this knowledge? And um, in an institution like this, do you think that we're fulfilling um, his legacy? And if you had your druthers, what more would you ask for? Oh man, well, we got two minutes. Um, <laughs> no, I appreciate the question. Um, so I didn't see anything directly in his in his work where he talked again this is sort of my interpretation of scholarship as soldiering as you as you so eloquently put it um, and I, I think that he was really just he was on the front lines of not not simply spreading uh, American history and culture um, globally because again most a lot of this traveling is done, during the Cold War. So you could argue, you know, well, maybe he's just sort of, as many scholars are doing, they're spreading Amer the theory and ideology of American democracy. But what I found is, in almost every lecture, he continuously raises the issue of America's flaws and how you cannot tell American history without talking about the history of black folks. Um, and that particular lecture that, that you mentioned uh, that he gave in Berlin in 1990, what Europeans should know about African-American history, I wanted to bring it. I, I had it. I printed it out and I meant to bring it. But I had never seen him write like this before. The first couple pages, he reimagines what American history would look like if it was the Africans that came to America first. Uh, because he talks he says that what you should, what Europeans should know about African American history is that African American history starts with the intersection of Europe and Africa. All right, so you are as 1990 Germans in Berlin, as much responsible for African American history as as I am as an African American. Okay, and so don't forget that you know African American Africans didn't just show up in America, but in the first couple of pages he sort of goes into this thing about, well, what would have happened if uh, 
Africans from Ghana and Nigeria would have came over first, and then all of a sudden these Europeans started coming over. Um, what would that interaction go be like? And he, it's only like a page where he kind of gives this imaginatory scenario, um, and then he kind of abruptly says, "Well, we all know that history tells us that 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 never happened," um, and sort of goes into you're as much intertwined in the history of black people as anyone and understand what your place is in the legacy of the black experience in America. Um, so does that answer your question? I hope. Yeah, uh, just also, you know, I mean, oh. what would you like to see as, you know, like a black? Oh, well, you know, honestly, I think that when we had the symposium a couple of weeks ago, one of the takeaways that a lot of attendees, myself included, um, felt like was it was a gathering of people who are on the forefront of ensuring, and I think this is one of Franklin's lasting legacies, that you can't, you can't tell the story without talking about black people. You just can't do it. Um, and he would never call himself a black historian. He would call himself a historian of the American South. But when he talked about the American South, he didn't talk about Andrew Jackson or you know the Confederacy, the sort of the the whitewash narrative. He would always start with black folks and white folks are hand in hand in building the legacy of this country, and I think that's what the how his legacy has brought to fore with what we experienced at the symposium a couple of weeks ago is that there are there's a tremendous pool of scholars who are still beating that drum that. You have to look at black folks when you're talking about Americans. You just can't tell the story without that. Um, so I, it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Um, the, I think the, the next step that Franklin was really um, passionate about is, well, once you know the history, then you got to be able to reconcile that history too, um, which is why he spent so much time working at the Center for Reconciliation in Tulsa having national conversations on race when he was a part of the, the President's Advisory Board under Bill Clinton. Um, he was interested in having an open dialogue about race and the, um, the legacy of race in this country. And it's something that is, we're still wrestling with, right? We still haven't had that crescendo moment where we all kind of go like, oh, okay, yeah, all right. All right, and it doesn't mean that you put it down once you have that moment, but it means that we've come to common ground. How can we build from here? Um, and I think that's sort of what he was passionate about. Um, and for him, the lens, the best lens to do that was through history. So I think we're doing okay. <laughs> Thank you.